Hello, my name is Colleen. Welcome. I was given this opportunity to bring the word today, and I was so excited. And then I found the topic, gentleness and self-control. And well, as a little girl, I was never the stereotypical, you know, sunshine and rainbows and, and just a gentle little thing. Instead, I always had rocks in my pockets, and I like bugs and snakes and slugs. And when I got into school, I was not really liked much, so I had a bit of a temper. And um, so gentleness and self-control weren't necessarily easy things that I came along with in my Christian life. And becoming a Christian later in life, when I read Galatians 5, 22, 23, which says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. I had a few questions, but let's pray first. Lord, thank you so much for just coming and meeting with us today, that you have come to show us your love and kindness, that you have shown us how to be gentle, and that you will show us how to control ourselves in, in the way that you desire, Lord. Thank you so much for being here and being among us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So you may be looking at this list in Galatians and thinking, you have questions? This is a pretty straightforward list, but what you may not realize is that I'm a perfectionist and, well, I like to overanalyze everything. So you're just going to have to go ahead and humor me here. So gentleness, let's, let's start there at the beginning. So have you ever thought about what gentleness actually means? Does it just mean like you're, how hard you're petting a cat? You've got to be gentle? Like, is that what gentleness means? What it actually means is that we approach someone in a humble and caring manner. That it, it can also be translated as being meek or humble. And I do my best to, uh, when I hear a word that I think I know the definition to because I've heard it all of my life, I like to take the time and go, do I really know what that means? And for the case of humbleness and gentleness, I wanted to take a little bit closer look there. Um, so when we look at that, what does it mean to be gentle? What does it mean to be humble in a biblical sense? We all know that we have certain rights that are allotted to us. Well, being humble means that you aren't going to put someone else's rights at risk um, of being hampered or, or even removed altogether because of what you want to do. It means that we don't take what's more than ours. We, we let other people have some. We share it means that we act within our own social class or, or act as if we're in a lower class, just in case. And so there are some amazing social studies out there with great apes and um, chimpanzees. And I want to tell you about one. I think it's a, with chimpanzees. Don't quote me on that. Could be wrong. But this is a great example of how not everyone is gentle. So the researchers decided that they wanted to take a look at what they would do, what chimpanzees would do if they were provided with an overabundance. And it started off with just wanting to be really nice to the chimps and provide them with this great abundance. So they piled up this heap of fruit so that way everyone in the troop could have as much as they wanted and more. So no one would lack. And what happened was that the male, the dominant male, came and guarded the heap of fruit. So that way no one could get any of the fruit at all. So only the few, his few select females and himself could eat of the pile of fruit, unless there were brave little ones that would run and grab a piece. But it was a struggle. This is a showing of, of how they weren't gentled with each other. The pile of fruit rotted away because there was no way that one male or even a few could have eaten the whole pile. 
But here's an example of what it looks like to be gentle. So take a look at Matthew 26. In this story, we have Jesus. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he is about to be arrested. He is about to be put on the cross. This is the end of his journey. And it's really tough. It's really stressful. And he has asked his disciples to go ahead and just stand watch while I go and pray. And he's praying to God, saying, like, if there's any way that we could not have this happen, if there's any way that I could stay while still being able to accomplish what we need to accomplish, like, let's do that. Let's go for a plan B. But if there's not a plan B, then let your will be done. And of course, there wasn't a plan B. So when Jesus is done praying in the garden, and he's so stressed out that he has blood being sweated out of his pores, he turns to his disciples, and they're asleep. The disciples are asleep. Now, if, if I was Jesus, which I'm clearly not, I would be upset because they had one job, just one job. They needed to stay awake and keep watch. That is all they needed to do. But no, they couldn't even do that. But Jesus was gentle with them. He woke them up. And that's when Judas and his posse show up. And they're here to arrest Jesus and take him to trial. And what happens? Peter, first reaction, like Peter does, is he draws a sword and cuts off the ear of one of the high priest's servants. And Jesus could react negatively towards Peter. He could reprimand him. But he goes to him in gentleness, in kindness, um, in loving approach to Peter. And he teaches him this idea well, he heals the ear of the servant. And this is in Matthew verse, uh, chapter 26, verses 52 to 54. And it says, put your sword back in its place, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled? that say that it must happen in this way. See, Jesus is showing a gentleness to Peter and his other disciples and the world. Jesus, as God, had every right to call on the angels to wipe out all of his opposition. We would be his opposition. We would have been wiped out. But instead, what Jesus does is he reaches out his hand and offers us a way into a relationship with him. Okay, now on to self-control. First, it's not the last on the list for kicks and giggles. Just as love wasn't the first, was the first on the list because it was really important. Self-control isn't the last on the list because it ties the list together into a nice little bow. So Paul has been trying to explain to the Galatians in this letter that as followers of Jesus, they're not required to follow the Old Testament laws. See, these laws were told you what you could and couldn't do, what you should and shouldn't do, which all of, there were false teachers in the area trying to convince the believers that that's what they had to do. They had to follow the law. Paul is trying to tell them that no, as followers of Jesus, we are now actually not following the law because Jesus has fulfilled the law, but we are submitting ourselves to the Holy Spirit. And this list contains just an example of what is produced in us as followers. And, and this isn't by our own work um, or our own strength, but instead it is from the, our faith when we believe and when we hear the gospel and have faith in it and the Holy Spirit comes, he produces that in us. Let, let me show you. Do your best to control your thoughts right now. Um, whatever you do, do not think about birds. Just don't do it. Don't think about how their, their songs. Don't think about how birds fly around and are just a great signal of spring. Don't think about birds at all. It's difficult. Self-control is so difficult. And for the Galatians, it 
there was a load of overindulgence happening in that area within that um, culture. And that's having an overindulgence in wine and other explicit activities. And now hearing that, you might think, well, self-control then means that I'm not allowed to have anything that I desire, that I must completely abstain. And that's not at all true because Jesus and God have created, um, have created desire in us, so it's not innately evil. What it is saying is self-control is moderation. No, nope, that, that's not a bad word. Moderation is not a curse word. It, it's finding that balance, that balance between overindulging and removing all desires from our life. And like I said, human desire was created by God. It's not innately evil. However, being able to control your own desires is also a demonstration of love in what you are putting others before yourself. Um, it, it's showing joy. It's showing peace and patience. I mean, ha, were you at, in line for your, the latest iPhone? Were you scooping up all of the PS5s that you could get your hand on because, you know, resale value? Or were you waiting? It, it shows kindness shows goodness. It shows faithfulness that God not only wants to meet your need, but because he is a good, good father, that he wants to meet your desires and what you want in life as well. It means that it's gentleness in that we aren't taking away from others and what they want in life, so that way we can overindulge. Look at Proverbs 25, 28. It says, like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. By focusing fully on what meets all of our wants and desires, it's a sin. It hurts other people, those we love and then those we've never met at all. So, so let me give you an example here. So let's say I really need some frosting, really badly. And I love frosting more than I love cake. So I go to the store and I get some frosting, but I can't control myself. So I buy all of the frosting just to make sure, ooh, that one has sprinkles, just to make sure that whenever I want frosting in the future, I can have frosting in the future. What I don't know is in buying up all of the frosting that the woman that couldn't go to the bakery because she couldn't afford someone to make her wedding cake no longer has the frosting to make it herself. That the little boy who struggled through quarantine and is really looking forward to his birthday cake, well, I hope he really likes just cake because there is no frosting anymore. And... Not only have I failed to control my own desires, where is my gentleness? Where is my humility? Where is my love and kindness or, or faith that God will provide me with frosting when I desire frosting? Where is my joy outside of the frosting tub? So how, how do we improve our gentleness or our self-control? because that's the big one. We might see that we are not where we want to be. How do we get better? We can't do it by ourselves. You can't have the strength of will to improve this sort of thing. It's because it's the Holy Spirit in you that does it with you. I used to have outbursts of rage to the point where I would hurt others and I would hurt myself. But when I became a, a Christian, that, that changed. Yes, it took years, but I may, and I may still get angry, but it's not to where it used to be. And what I want to do is give you a chance to start that journey with God so that way the Holy Spirit can walk with you and help point out areas in your life where you can change. 
Because when the Holy Spirit points the thing out for you to change, they're not just going to let it you to your own devices. They're going to walk with you through that change. So that way you are successful. So please join me in this prayer. Jesus, I know I haven't always shown humility and gentleness to those around me. That I have lacked self-control and sinned against you. Please forgive me as I choose to follow you as my Savior. Fill me with the Holy Spirit that I may learn control over myself through his help, the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you've prayed that today for the first time, let us know. And it's really easy. What you can do is if you're on the website, noperfectpeoplehere.com, what you can do is right up in the top, just select Connect Cards. Right in there, there should be a place that you can click or write in that you are now following Jesus for the first time. And just fill out your information. And what we want to do is send you this book by our very own Pastor Lon Dean. It's My Next Steps. I'm a follower of Jesus. Now what? This is just a really great resource on what to do next. It even has the full book of John, so you don't have to you know, go out and find a Bible right away. This is a great source to start reading and, and getting to know who God is in your life. And we also pray over those, every connect card that comes in. So even if you didn't say that prayer for the first time, go ahead, fill out that connect card so we can pray for you that the Holy Spirit will be with you because self-control and gentleness are huge. They're so important. Like I said, self-control was at the end for a reason. It's important. Self-control isn't giving up your wants or needs. It's taking the time to think of the needs and wants of, of others first. Gentleness isn't removing your rights. It's using your freedom to not impinge on someone else's rights. Both mean that you just stop and consider others first. So as a next step, I just want you to stop and think about someone else this week. What can you do for them? This might just mean dropping off a donation at the food bank. Maybe it's frosting. But thank you everyone for coming and have a great rest of your week and stay tuned for more announcements.